Ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce you to you this afternoon, Dr. Corey Slovis. Uh, Dr. Slovis is the Director of Emergency Medicine at Vanderbilt Hospital. He is a Professor of Emergency Medicine at Vanderbilt University. He's the Medical Director for the Metropolitan Nashville Fire Department and also the Medical Director for the Nashville International Airport. Dr. B Dr. Slovis is going to talk to us today about Ebola. We've known about Ebola for some period of time, uh, but uh, we haven't concerned ourselves with it except over the last few weeks uh, when we had some cases here in, uh, in the United States, uh, and specifically in Texas. And it's obviously been of great concern to a great many people, mostly because we haven't understood it. And I've spent uh, a good amount of time over the last couple of weeks learning all that I can uh, from uh, the experts here in Nashville, but also on TV. Uh, my concern was, can we serve the public in the manner that we need to, and can we do it in a manner that safeguards our own personal safety? And uh, we've uh, spent quite a bit of time uh, looking at our resources and looking at our procedures, and I've been very concerned. Uh, last week, uh, we brought Dr. Slovis to our ComStat presentation, and he talked to us in everyday English about the Ebola virus. Dr. Slovis is very good at taking a very complex problem and bringing it down to a level that we can understand and put in procedures. So after listening to Dr. Slovis, I realized that I am now confident that we can serve the public in a manner that it needs to be served and in a manner that safeguards every member of this police department. So I want you to welcome Dr. Corey Slovis here with us today. What I'd like to do today is make you an expert in what the Ebola virus is, how you can protect yourself and potentially others, and most importantly, to understand that it's gonna be really hard to get Ebola. I'm not saying you can't, but you almost have to try. And after I'm done speaking, I would welcome questions. I want you to leave here as an expert. I have some slides. Uh, there's not going to be anything really complicated, and I am not an infectious disease expert, and I'm not going to talk to you about virology. I want to make five opening points, and, and this really puts together much of what I'm going to say. Number one, a, it's the Ebola virus. Ebola is a virus just like influenza or the flu is a virus. And unfortunately, early on, the symptoms of Ebola are very much like the symptoms of the flu. So as we get ready for flu season, get ready for, in quotes, that patient, that, that individual who's not yet a patient might have Ebola. And so you want to know about it. It begins with fever and body aches, but the core concept, the thing that really helps us, and the reason it hasn't spread to millions of people in Africa, is individuals are only contagious when they are symptomatic. Now, you should never trust anyone completely. Be careful in trusting anyone. But what I do want to tell you is that of the people that have come into contact with known Ebola patients in the United States, other than two nurses who were very much involved in the care of a critically ill patient, no one has gotten Ebola. Not the doctors or nurses who saw the individual who died in Dallas, not any of the people in the ED that were around him, and not anyone else upstairs, just two nurses who unfortunately, and this was th the beginning, this is our first real patient, who were not as well gowned and gloved as we now know you need to be, especially when patients are terminal. And with a little luck, you're not gonna be dealing with pre-terminal or terminally ill or critically ill patients. Uh, EMS will respond, and I'll talk about that in a moment. It is only spread by body fluids. And exclusive of Ebola, lots of stuff is spread by body fluids. And that's why if you're dealing with someone that you're going to have to make body contact with, and you have the ability to, wear gloves. And if they're coughing or sick, wear a protective mask. And if you're going to be taking them into custody, put a mask on them too. Bodily fluids spread lots of stuff besides Ebola, and they spread it even easier than Ebola. Hepatitis, HIV, take care of yourself, be careful. 
So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the background of Ebola except to tell you that it's spread by animal vectors, especially the bat. Don't go near any bat uh, droppings. In the United States, they spread, spread rabies. In Africa, one of the things they can spread is Ebola. The incubation period of, of Ebola is up to 21 days. And most people get sick in about a week. Now, what that means is, as of today, uh, more than 40 people of uh, close to 50 have been cleared because within 21 days they haven't converted. This is a disease that's hard to get. But the, the <coughs> first symptoms are like you got hit with the flu, headache, fever, body aches. And in a couple of months when it's flu season, a lot of people are going to have those symptoms. The way Ebola kills is the virus replicates and it starts to cause cellular destruction and that's why there's so much vomiting, diarrhea and, uh, and about a third of people hemorrhage. What you want to realize is the following. Someone who looks normal to you, who's not febrile, who's not sick, he or she, more likely he, is going to say, I have Ebola, to maybe keep you at a distance. He might but he's not yet infectious. The virus has to multiply a lot in his body. You need to know that the Ebola virus is endemic now in three countries and three countries only from Africa. Not Africa, three countries. And until that changes, as long as you're aware of those countries, if the person hasn't just immigrated from Liberia, Sierra Leone, or Guinea, he or she doesn't have Ebola and they're not at risk for it. Just because they know someone in Dallas, they're not at risk for it. You could even fly to Dallas today, you're not getting Ebola. The fatality rate that people talk about is 50%. Please understand, the 50% is if you're in an African village without IV fluids, without critical care. And so we're hoping if anyone does get Ebola, which you're not, that we're going to dramatically lower what that fatality rate is. Who's at risk? If you're taking care of a patient in a hospital, you're at risk. And then the other group are family members. And that's how the Ebola virus has spread a lot in Africa. There's been a lot of denial that it's really a disease. And it's tradition there that not only while you're caring for someone, you make a lot of body contact. But after they die, there's a traditional washing where you're exposed to a huge amount of bodily fluids. I'm repeating the point, bodily fluids, close contact. Asymptomatic people are not contagious. This is a slide that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on except to tell you one thing. Measles, mumps, HIV, uh, respiratory distress syndrome, they're much easier to catch than is Ebola. So, if you're wearing gloves, if you have a mask on, it's essentially impossible unless there's shed bodily fluids. Uh, we have isolation rooms, we're drilling. You don't need to worry about that. But I thought for today, if I were a police officer, I don't want to hear a lot of talk and just tell me exactly what I need to do if there is a suspicion of an Ebola patient. And so I have five things that I think I'd want to know and do if I were a police officer or if I was in public safety in any way. Number one, if you think a patient is at risk, and I apologize, in my kind of work we call them patients, if you think an individual that you're encountering is at risk for Ebola or you're told my mom is in there and we're worried she has Ebola, number one, you should avoid direct contact with that patient. Unless there's a reason for you to be in direct contact, you get in touch with your dispatcher, you request EMS to respond. You limit who goes near the patient. You don't need a whole bunch of people seeing the patient or potential patient. You've called EMS and you do two more things. If you have to touch the individual, who for me is going to be a patient and for you may be of a different status, wear gloves and mask. And if you have to take that patient into custody, put a mask on him or her. Unless you are touching with unprotected hands, blood, vomit, diarrhea, some bodily fluids, 
you, if the person does have Ebola, cannot get it. And we're hoping in Nashville that no one has Ebola ever. Um, and then we have the EMS history. They're going to ask questions very quickly. So let me close by saying only bodily secretions are contagious and asymptomatics cannot give you Ebola. I want to close with five things and then I would welcome questions. I want you to feel like I own this disease. I know how to, in quotes, diagnose it if they're not from one of those African nations. I know it's flu-like symptoms and I know how to protect myself and others. Number one, be smart, be safe, be careful. And in your training, you're always thinking about public safety and your own safety. Well, think about that for this disease too. Anybody's secretions can give you a lot of things. Be careful. Ebola's gonna go away. We're, we're there, but people are always gonna have diseases that they might wanna donate to you. Be careful. It's really hard to contract Ebola. Fear and ignorance are our enemies. And knowledge is key. The public's scared. And hopefully this is gonna die down now. But the public is scared. And you wanna present yourself as someone who's there to protect them and someone who's there to protect their loved ones. And you can, because you know about the disease. That is all I wanna say other than your hands can be contagious. Be careful what you touch. What kind of questions can I answer? Um, please, I, I'd like to be able to. Yes, sir. Sir, I have two for you. Uh, the first, how long is the Ebola virus able to live outside of a host body on the surface? That's a great question. The question, if you didn't hear it, how long can Ebola last on a surface? So Ebola, luckily, is very sensitive to drying and as soon as it's dry, it appears that it's no longer contagious. And it's interesting, the physicians and nurses at Emory, where one of the victims went, they tried culturing surfaces, and if it was dry, they were unable to culture Ebola. So it's difficult to contract. If you don't see uh, something on the surface, then it's unlikely you'll be able to contract Ebola. Having said that, if you go and there's lots of blood or vomitus or bodily fluids, be aware, it, you may not see it shiny, but it's there. I would be more careful then. And the uh, second part, sir, uh, do you foresee any fallout from Nashville uh, with the ongoing involvement of the 101st Airborne Division supporting uh, these African countries? That's a great question. I mean, we have the 101st Airborne. Uh, we provide a lot of troops to a lot of areas. It is unlikely that a sick individual will be transported back to Nashville, but someone coming back from an affected nation, likely they will be kept for 21 days without circulating in the public at the present time. That's what's most likely to occur. And I say that both based on common sense and the fact that I don't think our government is prepared for another horrific PR disaster and sending our troops to fight this disease and then having one of those individuals infect a large cohort group, I don't foresee it. Thanks, sir. Any other, yes, ma'am. When is it recommended to put on or take off PPE equipment? So when you say PPE equipment, do you mean gown and glove and stuff like that? Or do you mean just, when you, for you all, personal protective gear is predominantly gloves and a face mask. Is that what you're asking about? Yes, sir. So, you should wear gloves whenever you think you're going to be making physical contact with someone who might be ill or potentially could transmit anything <coughs> to you. And I'm not sure of all of your protocols, but if you are going near someone and you're going to have to touch them, they are potentially a vector of disease. If they are spitting, if they appear ill, if you could get something spewed from their face, put a mask on them. Uh, if you do a routine traffic stop, you don't need to gown and glove. Uh, you ought to be able to pick these patients up very quickly. And just be aware, it's not likely that you're gonna get Ebola from them. 
but you're more likely to get TB, hepatitis. You're more likely to get the flu or the common cold. Other questions? Yes, sir. How do we know if a patient's really contaminated with Ebola and not something else? So the question was, how do you know if someone has Ebola? You would send their blood off to the CDC or the state lab, and in nine hours we'd find out. So we're not going to know, and you especially are not going to know. What you want to do is decide, is the patient at risk? Now, you can wait for EMS, and they're going to EMS will ask the questions. But in your own mind, and something that will help you right on the scene with someone, are th have they recently come in the past 21 days from one of the three affected African nations or been with someone from one of the three affected African nations? If they are not from an isolation ward at one of the four hospitals, they haven't just come here from uh, Liberia, from Sierra Leone or Guinea, or their family member isn't sick from one of those three countries, they don't have Ebola. You are you're good. So you can ask them, where have you been? What's your travel history? Any other questions I can answer? Yes, sir. What would be the best way to clean up a contaminated surface and what materials would you spend? Great question. Thank you. So something I should have said in my presentation is Ebola hates alcohol. Ebola hates chlorine bleach. So if you have a hand wipe that has alcohol on it, or if you happen to shake hands with your partner and you've never really liked him or her, not that there's anything, you don't have to like all your partners, you just have to tolerate them. If you merely get your hands wet with alcohol, you kill Ebola. And so something we do in our drills, and if we do have a potential patient, every stage of us uh, taking off our PPE, Every stage, we keep wiping down our hands. So alcohol, or if you take chlorine bleach that's diluted one to 10, it cleans everything. And you can't, get, if there was a bunch of, first of all, let me say, you don't need to decontaminate anything other than your hands. If there's a surface, we have hazmat units, they love doing stuff like that. They'll spray down, they'll do your whole car. But all you want to do is wipe off your hands with alcohol, and you are no longer able to transmit it. And I'd be careful taking off my gloves, and I'd put them in a secure place. Yes, ma'am. I know you said that the symptoms resemble flu-like symptoms. Could you be a little more detailed, maybe, for those who have never had the flu? You should never have the flu get the flu shot. It mostly works. The flu. But I wish it worked 100%. It works 60 to 70%. And if you do get the flu, you're less likely to have more severe symptoms. Get the flu shot. Uh, your arm will be a little bit sore, but it really beats having the flu knock you down for a couple of days. So the Ebola virus starts out like you just don't feel, if you're infected with it, you just don't feel right. Your bones are achy. You begin to develop a fever initially low grade and then it spikes. You have that and many people report a fairly severe pulsating headache. That's the first symptoms and that looks much like the flu. For those of you that have been knocked on your butts, uh, I, there are other names for it but I'm on camera, uh, from the flu. But then it changes. People's body begins their, their bodies begin to lose the fight as the Ebola virus rapidly multiplies. Uh, and as there's cellular multiplication, there's nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, which may turn bloody. And then uh, there, there's shutdown of various organ systems. You're un very unlikely to see that patient. That would be usually a 911 call for EMS. If there was a patient, and I want to be really clear, I honestly believe we will not likely have a patient, but we could. You're likely to see someone very early. And those people are going to look like anybody else with a fever. Other questions? Sir. I have two questions, sir. Is Ebola considered an airborne threat? So the question is, is Ebola an airborne threat? And I want to be really clear. Talking to someone, no. The only way it could be airborne is if there is a droplet, and I'm not going to do it. If I, so as I'm, all okay, right, let's assume I have Ebola, and I want to assure you I don't. Um, 
and I'm talking, uh, I can spread the common cold as, as I exhale. But for me to really spread Ebola, I'm going to have to spit or cough, and there has to be a liquid droplet, and it has to get onto this, do I call you an officer, recruit, a uh, lieutenant, right? Trainee. Trainee, sir. This trainee, sir. Uh, uh, I have to get a droplet onto him, and I have to get it onto a mucous membrane. Or I can get it on his skin, and he has to touch it and get it on a mucous membrane. Otherwise, no. And that's the beauty of Ebola. If it was airborne, so many people in that ER would have Ebola, because they didn't know at first. In fact, they sent the gentleman home. All of his family would have Ebola, and they don't. The, the cruise ship, everyone on the cruise ship, or many of them, would have Ebola. Uh, a woman who turned out to have Ebola, the second nurse, flew on an airplane. None of those individuals have yet contracted it and it will soon be cleared. So no, not airborne, but mucus or droplet. And droplets can be airborne. So if you have someone coughing, regardless of whether they have Ebola or not, they get the face mask, and you do too. You don't need their germs. You saw the chief give me the elbow. Not the elbow, but a, a nice, a gentle elbow. I, although we shake hands often, it's probably better to bow, elbow. I mean, your hands are vectors of diseases, and so are your, so are your uh, potential uh, recruits into the back of the car with handcuffs on. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. So if you're pregnant, we do not recommend Ebola. That if, <laughs> so uh, uh, the question was, if you have a pregnant woman who contracts Ebola, the mortality absolutely is going to be higher. Now, I can't talk about in a modern healthcare system, but it's a devastating disease, and uh, a woman is at increased risk if she's carrying a child to uh, have organ shut down, much more likely to miscarry, et cetera. Uh, they get hypotensive, they, they lose their blood pressure, they bleed. Uh, I, I'm sure it's devastating to a pregnant woman. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, should we as the police be inside a perimeter with others wearing personal protective equipment if we're not wearing any? So that, that, the question is, if there is a perimeter established and as soon as someone crosses that perimeter, they're wearing, wearing personal protective gear, then that hot zone is not where you need to be. If they have to put on personal protective gear to enter an area, unless you've already had Ebola and are immune, no, you should not be in there. And I, you all work uh, with uh, tactical squads and there's a cold, a hot, and a warm zone, that hot zone where there is potential infection, whether it be body fluids or a patient, we have other people for that zone. You guard the hot zone. You don't get into it. And I, 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 I don't know all of the workings of SWAT, but I would assume that if you're not part of the SWAT team, unless you were trapped in the hot zone, you don't enter it. And it's unless you're told by the SWAT commander. It's the same thing with Ebola. That hot zone, stay out. Any other questions? If you don't feel like you're expert at Ebola, you should ask me a question. Doctor, could you talk to us uh, two things? One, if we inadvertently step in some bodily fluids, and two, gloving and degloving procedures. Thank you, Chief. So the first question was, you're entering an area and you step into what turns out to be vomit, blood, feces, your shoe is potentially a vector of that disease. What you do not want to do is get more of it on you. And that foot or leg ought to be decontaminated. And so we would expect our fire service to respond rapidly and assist you. But if you have something on your hands, besides alcoholing them before you take off your gloves, think about the gloves as good and bad. The outside of your glove is bad. It has germs and disease potentially on it, even though you disinfected. As you take it off, what you want to do 
is use the inside of the glove, which is sterile, as your protection. So with my contaminated hands right now that have gloves on, you might not be able to see them where you are, but these have gloves on. I'm going to use this dirty hand and start to take off this glove. I'm using a dirty hand to touch the dirty glove. So it's half off, half on. Now I'm going to use the dirty glove and take this half off. And then I'm going to try to work it so that I don't touch with my fingers the outside of that glove. You try to work it off. Once those gloves come off, you view them as contaminated and stay away from them and let our people with their gloves on put them into a bag. Now most of the time you're not going to be dealing with with someone that contaminated. If you use alcohol, take them off carefully and after they're off, your hands might be contaminated. Just go ahead and redo the alcohol. There has been no Ebola spread with alcohol. Once the alcohol is used, that area is not decontaminated. That, that, conta- that area is no longer contagious or contaminated. But use common sense. If there's a bunch of stuff and you got it on you, you need to be decontaminated. You need to be careful. And the way Doctors Without Borders have been so careful is they view their bodies until they're cleaned off as potentially contaminated. You're not doing this. I've just put this into my body. That's how you get disease. Just view yourself as a potential vector. Use the alcohol. It's cheap. It works impeccably well. Let it dry. Other questions? I appreciate the work you all do or will be doing. And we want you to stay very safe. Uh, I think with minimal common sense, we'll get over this scare. And if we do have potential patients, you work as a team with fire and EMS, and then they'll be brought likely to Vanderbilt, and, and we'll take care of them too. It's a privilege talking with you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.